obviously you've got a, a number of faces apart on the right hand side. I'll introduce all these people who have helped me out today. I have to say I'm a lot more anxious about today because the previous sessions I've done have been, I fully planned it and today is, it could be anything because I've got some brilliant people helping me out. I mean, let's get this started done. Does two really equal one? And there's the proof, two equals one. How can we argue? Let's find out. If we know that A equals B, then we surely know that A minus B equals zero. One of the reasons how we, um, I remember when we talked about zero pairs a few weeks ago, and that's the existence of zero pairs, how, they can, how we can actually explain them to the kids and how they can be useful when it comes to algebra tiles. So if A minus B equals zero, then the value of that bracket, well, that has to be zero. And therefore, when I reach this line, here's the error. That means I must have divided both sides by zero, and we know what happens when you divide by zero. One big fat math error. Still always hate the fact it says math, but there we go. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name's Tom Manners. On Twitter, I'm at Manomatics. That's my email address. That's my face pre-lockdown. Um, my wife likes this, so who knows? I might just keep it. Um, carrying on, uh, I am PUC tutor for maths at Arthur Terry Teaching School in the West Midlands. So if you know anyone else to be a teacher uh, this year, we are still recruiting. Um, and it's a brilliant job because it gives me a chance to work uh, delving more into research and finding out what the what's going on out there in the world of math teaching. So. Um, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I also do work though for the NCTM, I'm a professional development lead, and for two days a week I work as a consultant and I go and see schools. Um, and part of that is working as a teaching for mastery specialist. Now mastery, if you've seen one of my first videos, um, I, the word mastery is discussed in many different ways by many different people, but I have one of the best mastery specialists joining me today. Uh, who also works at the Central Maths Hub. I want to make sure I do talk about the five big ideas and mention them briefly because I mention them each week. Um, but if you haven't come across these, it's the first time you've seen them uh, and the first time that maybe you're finding out about the Maths Hub, then just to give you a bit of information about it. Uh, the mastery idea is we teach for understanding by using mathematical thinking, fluency, variation, representation of structure and coherence. Now, it doesn't mean every lesson has to have all of these. Um, it's hoping it would have some of these. And I'm hoping today's session will give everybody a few ideas about lesson planning. But you might have no particular interest. And in the Central Maths Hub, there are a number of work groups going on. And I've, I've, I've put a few there on screen from primary and also from secondary, uh, some of the things that are going on. And then there's post 16 as well, for those of you who um, would be working in that sector. And the Teaching for Mastery particular oh, workshops, wow. <laughs> a couple of those that I run. If you know nothing about these maths hubs, my big hint, please join the mailing list for your local maths hubs. One thing I should point out quite explicitly, which I did before, these are free. All these are free, and in fact, you get paid to attend, I think all of them really, Helen knows more, but these are all free to take part in. Uh, they go across England, uh, and so please go onto mathshubs.org.uk, join the mailing list for your local maths hub, and see what programs you might be interested in to be a work group, as, as all good CPD, it's not just one-offs, it's about the start of a work group and working together. That's what the best CPD does, and that's the way that the maths hubs deliver it. And so today's session, lesson planning for all key stages, what's the same, what's different? And as I've written just here, I've got um, a couple of people joining me who I know from various, uh, well, different places. Uh, so I'm going to introduce them one at a time. And I think you can see her on the, the, the side of your screen. Helen, good morning. Hi. Helen, you win the backdrop competition. Um, you <laughs> even had a different one when we practiced this a couple of days ago. How many math backdrops do you have? Quite a few. Quite a few. I, I need to borrow some of them, slash steal <laughs> some of them. Uh, and talking of stealing, today should be all about stealing ideas from each other. So there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Helen will give us so many ideas. Um, on Twitter, she's at HyperHelga. Um, she'll excuse me if I introduce her with all these different um, all these different titles and all these different experiences she's got. Uh, leading maths across a small mat. Uh, maths teacher, of course. Teaching for Mastery Lead for the Central Maths Hub. Uh, you are also in a, a professional development lead, an SLE. I always forget what this means. Mathematics specialist teacher, I think it is. Yeah, math specialist teacher. Awesome. Uh, a math consultant working with all types of schools across the country. Helen is available and participated <laughs> in, in Shanghai Exchange uh, with the NCTM. So she got to be a part of that, which is fantastic. Uh, and then I introduce... Um, this is a quite, a, I, I don't want to be seen to be biased to be um, having my, uh, my mate Alan on, because Alan is one of my best mates. Uh, it's but the only don't... reason I'm on, Tom. That, that's the only reason I'm on, really, isn't it? No, but yeah, but the thing is, we don't talk maths teaching very often. No. Now, no. the reason I have a maths career is because when I did my first interview at a school, um, Alan was the teacher who watched me, and I didn't get the job. That, no. I didn't get the job on the day. Um, what a git. Uh, but I, 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 
you, I, I've, never, I've never asked you about this, but I didn't get the job because I didn't say, I, I said I couldn't do A-level and the school required me to do A-level. A week later, they phoned me back and offered me saying I still won't do A-level um, because I wasn't ready for it. I wanted a bit more practice at GCSE. Uh, but Alan's um, been head of the department in two state secondaries, um, very different secondaries. And, and I thought Alan would be great for today because uh, Alan was the first head of maths for the University of Birmingham Research School. A very unique school in the country. I think, I think the only university school in the country still, maybe. Um, I don't know. Uh, it was the only secondary when it opened. I don't know if there's, I think there was a primary one as well. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, and, and now uh, at King of the Five Ways, specialising in, specializing in the history of maths, A-level curriculum pro 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 provision, and he's a course leader for the Prince's Trust Institute's New Math Teacher Subject Days. Uh, I love working with Alan. Again, he does happen to be one of my best friends, um, but it's not about that today, because honestly, when we meet up, uh, and we go to Spice Girls concerts and, and, and Power Ballad Night Out. We don't talk about math teaching. And so I'm really, really intrigued to be joining, um, intrigued to have him with us today doing this. Oh, looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. And again, thank you, Helen, as well. It should be really interesting. And, and, I, and one thing I think is going to come out of today is looking at secondary and primary. We've got primary and secondary colleagues listening today as well. It'll be interesting to see what contrasts, what's the same, what's different. Brilliant question for the maths classroom. Um, but why is it different as well? Uh, but we'll see about that. So what this session should include, each of us are going to go through our approaches to planning lessons in turn. Uh, because we've got a, a primary sandwich with two secondaries, uh, we're going to start with the secondary, then a primary, and if we've got time, we'll fit in me, me finally. Uh, I do want to remind everybody watching today that we're likely to be generalising. It doesn't mean this is what we do for every single lesson. Then again, we, some of the things might be we always do include. Um, also remember, we'll probably only skim the surface of many areas of a lesson as well. Uh, we're going to include how we create resources or where we find an ideas for resources because you do not have to create them. The maths world is so beautiful right now mm -hmm. that people share so many good things uh, and it's a great time to be in the profession. Uh, we will ask other quest each other questions and challenge each other. We're all friendly people and we've got to know each other just before today. So Helen and Alan will um, be more than happy to shout abuse at me in any format mm -hmm. if it's something I, don't, I, I say they don't like. Um, but Adam, producer Adam. Hi, Adam. Hello. That's a good start. It is a, it is a good start. Um, <laughs> there he is. Hi, Adam. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, he, I can see he's online, but maybe he just can't speak. Uh, he'll also take questions through the chat facility, so please do send them in at any stage and he'll jump in. So, Alan, I'm going to start with you. Um, so we're going to get you to share, share your screen. Um, hello, hello, hello. Oh, I Adam, you know, Adam. Right. Bad, bad timing there. Um, right. I think I have to stop share, don't I? So let me stop sharing. Hi. Okay. Hi. And Make sure I know what he's doing. Has everyone seen my screen now? We can, yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I've put a little PowerPoint together just to, so that I can think through um, all of the things that I wanted to talk about today. And I, I quite like this image here to start off with. Because it reminds me that as much as we plan, um, our lessons are dependent on so many different things. Um, things like the time of day, the time of year, who's done what to who at break time and that sort of thing. So our lesson plans are very fragile things at the best of times. And some of my best lessons actually have veered significantly away from where I'd wanted them to go. Um, by the way, Helen and Tom, please feel free to just bump in at any at any point. Feel free to interrupt me. I'm not precious about this at all. If you've got questions or comments or anything, just uh, have a go. Um, please do uh, talk do through. You know, do, you know, so, do you know what, Alan? What you said there, though, is really true, that those best lessons, when you've got that question, the, the, the kids have said something and you need to go down that route. And, mm -hmm. and people who are new to the profession often get really stuck with that because they start thinking, do you know what? Uh, this was my lesson plan. I've got to follow that. But if yeah. they, if the children want to investigate something, they want to ask questions, yeah. then you go with it. And, and those are the ones that when we can just be um, off the cuff and, and just enjoy the questioning and, 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 and suddenly you can relax in those lessons. So never be scared to go for away from the direction if that's what the kids are sensing, that you're sensing from them. Yeah, certainly as you, as you become, as you teach more and more, you do get that confidence to be able to do that. Um, I, I didn't feel confident enough to do that in my first couple of years of teaching, but like I've, I've been teaching long enough now that, yeah, I can, I can just veer off and think, actually, this is more interesting than what I planned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Tom asked me to think about my, my influences to start off with. So I've, I've, I've listed a few of them there. There's, there's books that I read um, or have read and keep going back to. 
Um, I think I started, when, when I started teaching, I, I got the Getting the Buggers to Add Up book because I quite like the book title. Um, but it's a really good read and Lessons are for Learning as well is a, is a fantastic book to have, a, um, to have a look through. I'm currently reading um, The Elephant in the Classroom by Joe Bowler. I've read a couple of her books before and, and they're really, really good. I recommend anything by Joe Bowler. She's, uh, she really, she re um, writes really, really well about maths. And Yes But Why is a fantastic book. I can't remember who put me onto it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just brilliant. Um, it, it talks about why things work the way they do in the maths classroom. And that's, I think that's the most important question that students can ask in my lessons. I, I want them to be asking, why does this work? Why is that the case? Um, and yes, but why answers a lot of those questions. If you're new to teaching or if you're not massively confident about why certain things are the way they are, um, it, it's a really good book. I highly recommend that. Alan, that's uh, really important uh, as well because Assessment objective one, you've got it on screen there, national curriculum, conceptual yep. understanding. Um, and teachers are often a little bit scared. They just want to show the method, show the algorithm. But the, 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 the sweet spot is when you've got that procedural understanding and the conceptual understanding and, and having them combined together. And so you're absolutely right. That book by Ed Southall is really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also like the Lazy Teacher's Handbook. I think this is one that you gave me, Tom. I did. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's brilliant because it, it reinforces something that I really believe in the, in the classroom, that the students, <laughs> need to be work yeah, the students need to be working harder than I am. Uh, if, yeah. if I'm the one that's working the hardest in that classroom, something's wrong. Um, so so I, I certainly in the first couple of years of teaching, I, I left lessons to range because I've done so much work. And all the students had done was like cut out a tarsier and glue it in or something. But <laughs> but I was doing loads, and and I, that book kind of reinforced things to me and got me thinking a again about how I can um, just make make my lessons easier for me and more engaging for the students. So that's a really good book to read as well. Um, making every lesson count. There's a whole series of these books. Um, I think making every lesson count was the first one. Unfortunately, the can I move this? Yeah, there we go. That works. Um, yeah. And Tom's holding it up to his screen because underneath that, after making every lesson count, <laughs> there's a, a making every maths lesson count as well. And I've only just got into that one. Um, and again, Emma McRae there writes really, really well about maths and about how to just be an effective teacher and do your job really well. Uh, what else? Oh, yes. Um, the, the, my final influence is just I have worked with some fantastic people. Um, no teacher is an island. No teacher is going to be there just producing resources on their own. Um, I steal things all the time. Um, I've, I've stolen loads and created very little. <laughs> but, yeah, um, but it's 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 so true that if you've got a department or if you've got a network of people that can support you and can provide stuff for you, it's it's brilliant. So, yeah, those are my influences. Um, I'm sure there's more, but that, that's, what, that's what came to my mind straight away. Alan, and, and yeah. I, I'm almost like Helen to butt on this a little bit as well. I think you've made a really, really big point there about collaboration, um, because you know what I was like in my first few years of teaching. I was very nervous. So it was mm. in a grammar school and I was nervous that I wasn't good enough at maths. So I'd made it clear that I didn't want to do A level the first year mm. because and, and I always felt like I wasn't good enough and mm. you know that I, I struggled with that at certain stages but the the support that you and our head of department mark gave me at the time when i was mm. really struggling was incredible and just being able to talk through maths yeah. um is so important now helen do you get a lot of that with regards nervousness when it comes to primary i think an awful lot um i think also looking at your books very often primary teachers will say yes but that's a book just for secondary teachers you know mm. where are the primary books but actually looking at your book list i've read most of those and found those yeah. really really useful because yeah. teaching maths i think just teaching maths can there's a lot of similarities between whether you're teaching in secondary or primary yeah. um but i do think there's probably more nervousness because in secondary if you're a, a maths teacher you will talk with your department and there's a lot of people there that are enthusiastic and will talk to you about maths mm. in primary especially a few years ago before all the maths have started uh, all their work started primary teachers probably would be a little bit more nervous about talking about the maths mm. um, and really really unpicking the maths 
they'd have been more focused on talking about particular children or why particular groups of children couldn't get things, um, but actually really, really unpicking the maths. And I think that's something that hopefully has changed quite a lot recently with a lot of the NCTM work, the maths hub work, a lot of the um, collaborative work groups that are going on, open lessons, lesson study. It's just got teachers talking about it a lot more. I really think people need to talk and be and not be scared to talk about as well because mm -hmm. I did feel inadequate in my first couple of years of teaching and I didn't want to ask teachers mm -hmm. uh, and I think someone just put it on screen there Louise see the hello Louise um collaboration is so key so important mm -hmm. you're not expected to know how to best teach everything none of us are uh, and mm -hmm. I certainly don't and I like asking people and like talking about it which is why I'm so pleased I'm doing this with Helen Allen today yeah. and so anybody who's new to the profession today are coming into it there is nothing wrong with asking for help in yeah. fact, it's great that you talk to your colleagues because it makes you a much, much better practitioner, unquestionably. Mm. Please don't be scared of that. Yeah, I'm really lucky at the moment. My department is is really strong in terms of being able to to talk to each other about maths. We've got we've got a couple of we've got an MQT, a couple of RQTs. We've got people who have been teaching for 30 years, pretty much. So there's a load of experience there, and everyone's really happy to share, which is great. Um, one of the standing items in department meetings that we have is bring and share, where we talk about something that we do in, either in the classroom or a resource that we found. And that's a really important thing, I think, as well, if you're in a maths department, to have those department meetings where you are talking about maths with your colleagues. Cool. So, yes. All right. Carrying on then. Um, so I do want to preface what I'm talking about uh, today with this quote, I can't remember where I found it, but everything works somewhere, but nothing works everywhere. And I've got the pearly gates there because there's no hidden formula which is going to work in every single school, in every single context. And, um, and so what I'm very aware, because I've taught in a variety of schools, but like stuff that I'm going to talk about today is probably not relevant. And I'm really sorry if uh, some of the things that I say, you, you're just going to go, mm, it's not really worth, worth it for me. But um, I am I am very aware that a lot of people. I mean, we got what are the 200 people viewing this? But that means there's a, there's a whole bunch of schools and contexts mm. there where some of the stuff that I'm going to say today is not relevant. But hopefully, at least one or two of the things that we talk about is going to be. So anyway, um, so I thought I would start with questions that I ask myself before every lesson. So this is me even before I start planning. What what am I going to be trying to get out of my lessons? So. The first thing is, what do I want the class to know or to be able to do by the end of the lesson? And I mean, th there's a lot about recall and, and facts, but actually I think maths is more about skills and being able to do things. Um, so uh, I, I, that's the first thing, that, what do I want them to be able to do? And then I'll say, all right, well, how am I going to get them there? And I think that that last one gets missed off a lot when you plan maths lessons. How am I going to know that they get there? How do I know that my students can now factorize quadratics? How do I know that they can draw a, a straight line graph or measure something to the nearest centimeter? Um, so that's an important one. And then I started to think, all right, well, I've got two roles actually. I'm a teacher and I'm a head of department. So I've been really lucky to be able to go in and see lots of different maths lessons. And I started to think, all right, well, what do I want to see if I'm going into those maths lessons? What do I want to actually look at? And I think that first point is, is a huge one. Every pupil has to have an opportunity to succeed because maths has got such um, a stigma around it. You, you go to adults in the street and they will quite happily say, oh, yeah, I was never any good at maths. No one goes, oh, I can't read. But they'll quite happily say, yeah, I was never any good at maths. And that's probably because they didn't have that many opportunities to succeed. If you don't get an opportunity to, to get something right, if you don't see yourself making progress, you don't buy into it quite as much. So I think I'm, I'm looking when I see a lesson, where's the opportunities for success? Um, and it doesn't have, it could be they've answered five questions or they have plotted a really good graph or they found the volume of a cone or whatever it is. I want to see some opportunities for success there. And then I want to see some sort of challenge. I want to see the students being challenged to think about their learning, not just do 10 questions and if they get those 10, does the next 10 but think about why they're doing it and why it's important and then i want to see regular checks that they that the students learning is kind of going in the right direction i don't need it to be exactly 
in the in the way that the lesson plan's gone, but you want to really have regular sort of check-ins to make sure that students are, are, uh, are doing all right. One of the worst lessons um, is one where you just, you do your explanation, you give them the learning task, and then you just let them get on with it. I think there's got to be regular check-ins, even if it's just walking around the classroom, talking talking to the students. And they can be checking with each other as well, can't they? Um, absolutely, absolutely. The it's it, That's why I said me or someone else. Yeah. It, it, they can they can absolutely be doing it with each other, assessing their own work. Um, so yeah, that, those are the main things that I want to see when I'm when I'm looking at this. Alan, can I? Uh, because you've been sorry if you go back again. The, yeah, yeah. The, you said you're reading Joe Bowler. Uh, I've had the virus and I was locked away for a week, so I read that book as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, Helen, I know you'll be a big advocate of that, and yeah. I always yeah. see you with Ching join that that you want to join <laughs> in here because there, there's a lovely video on, on YouTube. It's only a minute long. Professor Mike Askew. Um, we, we build learn, you know, we build readers and we and it's kind of like what you said, Alan, we build writers, but we don't build mathematicians and mm. everyone can be a mathematician. We say that we want our kids to be uh, writers and readers, but we never say we want them to be mathematicians. And I, I know you'd kind of be very passionate. I'm about kind that. of hoping that after all of this, when people say that it's mathematicians that's saving the world at the moment, Absolutely. I'm kind of hoping after all of this, young people might see that mathematicians and scientists actually do quite important work. Um, and knowing your maths, I think at the beginning of lockdown, a lot of people um, didn't quite understand or couldn't estimate two meters distance. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe better at that now. I've got a great, I've got a great locus lesson about the loci of, um, of quarantine. It's, it's, yeah, it's really good. I've, I've gone slightly mad with all of the lesson plans that I've made because I have planned a few around quarantines and it's uh, yeah I think no, you're absolutely right. statistics is definitely going to have um, <laughs> a lot of interesting information to share isn't it yes yes absolutely I find it quite interesting to look at your bullet points there because actually those are the same things that I think about when I'm thinking about a lesson in primary even mm. if I was working with children in early years those are the same things that I'm thinking oh that, that's good <laughs> <laughs> all right am I uh, Okay to move yeah, in? Yeah, sorry. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm still before the lesson. So because I think a lot of the stuff is, a lot of the stuff that has to be done is before the lesson because you want to be relaxing in your lesson. You want to be looking at the students, talking to them, talking about their journey. And the more planning you get it done before the lesson, um, I think the better really because, uh, again, not I'm not talking about making fantastic PowerPoints because if, if you just do loads of PowerPoints, you're stuck doing the PowerPoint. Um, but thinking about what you want to achieve in the lesson and how you're going to do it. And the more you think about that, the more relaxed you can be in the lesson and actually enjoy the journey with the students. Because I think you've got to enjoy those lessons as well. Students feed off of the enjoyment that you get from the subject um, as much as anything. Um, it's hopefully a, a reasonably obvious one, but I always look, I always go back to the seating plan when I'm planning the lesson, just to have a look at, just to see that where everyone's sitting and think about, all right, well, It'll remind me, oh yeah, little Jimmy over here, I didn't do so well in the last lesson, I'm going to have to go and check them. Oh yes, Susie was a bit distracted last lesson, I need to go and see. Or um, we, we've got another student over here who, who did fantastically, I need to go and check them. But I always refer to the seating plan just because it refreshes in my mind how the last lesson went. Um, and if there's any follow up that I need to do for that last lesson. Um, I then go to my schemes of work and curriculum plans just to check that what I'm doing is going to be fitting in with what the department wants to see. And I look at the curriculum plan because I want to refer back to what they did last year or the year before, but I also want to look ahead because inevitably there's going to be students who will be completing work a little bit quicker. And I want to say, all right, well, where this is going next is, well, next year you, you've been factorizing linear expressions. Next year you're going to get a chance to have a look at the quadratic, have a look at this, let's see where it goes. So I'm looking not just at last year's, but next year's, so that I can say to students, where is this going? And then questioning. I I, uh, I had a, a while ago a, a big push on my questioning because I thought, I thought I need to have a little bit more of a, a think about what sort of questions am I asking in the lesson. And so I really do spend quite a lot of time thinking about the questions that I'm going to ask in the lesson, why I choose those questions, how I'm going to ask them, who I'm going to ask them to, 
And then I think I put it in bold there because I think it's the most important one. What am I going to do with the responses? Okay, because if you ask a question to a student and they give you the right answer, what are you going to do with that right answer? Or if they give you a wrong answer, what are you going to do with it? Um, so I think that's a really, really important one that you have to think about. It's all well and good putting a question on the board, getting students to hold up the mini whiteboard. But what do you do with the five kids who've got something wrong? And I think that needs to be thought of before the lesson because you don't want to be thinking about that on your feet. Alan, can I ask about seating plans? Um, because I think that, and I think, um, I mean, yeah, we're going to finish well before half past 11. It might be we cover some stuff now, Helen, that you were going to do later on. So apologies if we're jumping in on some things. Mm -hmm. But seating plans I find really interesting because how nervous people can be to actually be not change them regularly. But how do you want seating plans to look in, your, in, in the primary classrooms? How have you enjoyed, how have you had the most success? We think about, we, we tend to, I'm, I'm talking about teaching for mastery. Um, I have taught years ago where we had setting groups, but you know, the last few years, it's been teaching whole classes, no setting groups, so mixed prior attainment. Mm -hmm. And I think we tend to talk, think more about personality um, than their maths ability and thinking about which children will work well with other children putting two very quiet children next to each other that aren't going to talk doesn't work very well. Um, putting your highest attainer who's absolutely flying through everything next to a real child that's re real SEN with very you know, poor um, vocal skills um, isn't going to work. So it's thinking about the children that actually will work together on that table and also not necessarily moving them every day or, or necessarily every week, but not leaving them sat next to the same person. Mm -hmm. I have found from my own experience that a whole group of, we tend to have children sat on groups of six, but with a talk partner next to them. Um, but actually if some one or two children on a table are, are flying or, or one or two children are struggling, that table can all, almost be sucked down um, if you're not really mm -hmm. careful. So I think thinking carefully about the seating plan, thinking who you've got where, who you've got next to whom. Um, and then also with those questioning, like you say, who am I going to be calling on? Who am I going to be asking first? Who will be coming to the board? Because it, I think in the past, there was a tendency to ask the children who you thought would give you the right answer. Mm. Actually now, it's more actually, I'm going to go to the ones that I think are going to give me the wrong answer, because mm. then their, their friends in the classroom can unpick that with us. Um, so yeah, that seating plan really important, but more about the personalities and I the patient. They've got to sit with each other all day through English and geography and maths and all of those sorts of things, don't they? So I guess personality yeah. does play a big part in it. Alan, yeah. did you approach anything any differently in, in when you worked as head of department in a mixed attainment school uh, and in a grammar? Have you had to do that differently as a matter of interest? Um, I, well, I'm, I'll talk about it in a bit, but in terms of seating plans, you, I, I think one of the issues with mixed attainment, if you, if you put them into groups, um, so you have a top table, a middle table and a bottom, well, what, why aren't you just setting then, which is a bit <laughs> strange. So, really good um, point. yeah, so, so I, I try, I purposefully try to mix it up in my, in my mixed attainment groups where I, I have students who are strong, I have students who are weak, I have a PP student sitting next to someone who is a little bit more um, supportive in terms of sharing work and things. Because like, like you'll see in a bit, students will learn from each other. And if you put all of the bottom students together on the same table in your mixed attainment group, then <laughs> like they, they need to learn from each other and, and, and that kind of defeats the purpose of mixed attainment if you're putting them into, into those Alan, I, because I'm because I'm not sharing my screen I get to see the chats and there's people asking questions about what we're thinking about post COVID-19 how are lessons how a seating plan is going to look then I'm not expecting your Helen to have any answers to this by the way but it, isn't it funny that that's the big thing at the moment yeah. uh, we're worried about seating them based well Jazz makes a point about um, seating them based the mo getting the most out of maths conversations I think was what Helen was saying which is Jazz going for as well yeah. Encouraging paired work can be really difficult, actually, with the seating yeah. going forward. I think, so it's going to be really, I think it's going to be really difficult at primary because like, students will sit on the carpet and, and just talk to each other and they learn through playing games. How are they going to play games while they... <laughs> no, I, I, know, I know that I'm, that's a huge... I've got a thing about sitting on the carpet, ignore me! <laughs> I, love, I could see Helen's response to that, I didn't like that at all. Sorry, <laughs> I've, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a daughter who's in year one and I've got a son in, in nursery, so my only... 
my only um, experience of, um, of primary at the moment is just coming in at the end of the day to see them. So, so that, I'm sure they don't sit on the carpet all day. But, one thing um, I think, um, I think one of the, um, just one person said about mixed attainment and there's some people who are fiercely against it. And you, you read Mark McCourt's book and, he, and when a department say, we're bringing in mixed attainment teaching. So, well, how many years of training have you given your staff? Yeah. Uh, and then someone just sent a message to I know, um, trying to get somebody who can count one to a hundred who struggles to do that, teaching trigonometry. I think there are extremes. I don't want to profess to be an expert on it and I don't want to go too far down that because what I want to do today is make sure we've got a lot of ideas for resources. So I know I, I know because of your experience, both of you, that you've done a lot of mixed attainment, I want to mm -hmm. make sure that we don't go too far down that route because I want to make sure we share lots of ideas. But there yeah. are people vehemently against and uh, I, I, I've got splinters I can, I can on them, skip, quite frankly. I can, skip ahead to, I can skip ahead to my slides, which are talking about mixed attainment if you want to do it now. Um, or we can we'll come to it. Let's, let's, get, let's, get, let's, get, let's uh, keep going with what you've got because I'm all just right. interrupting all the time. So, yeah, so we're, we're still before the lesson. <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to move this because, again, in terms of questioning, um, I've, I, I've used Bloom's taxonomy since I, well, in and out since I, since I started teaching. I think Bloom's taxonomy is a huge um, influence on, on how I question these days. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of Bloom's taxonomy, it's, um, it's, a, it's a pyramid of the different types of questions and the different types of ways that you can ask questions. So at the bottom of the of the pyramid is just a remember it's a really bog standard sort of question that you could give to a student and hopefully they just remember the fact um like what is five times three um understanding is slightly is higher up on the pyramid because it requires slightly more um cognitive ability to understand that five times three means five lots of three which also means three lots of five um applying it then can they apply their knowledge can they analyze and break it down um, into into different parts can they evaluate and then finally right up at the top which is the one that I try to get to with most of my students is create get them to create something so five times three is 15 create an expression that equals 15 um, or create an expression uh, using the times tables or, or, or yeah so basically you, you work your way up the pyramid and you want to really be aiming for those top three layers of the pyramid when, when you try to question and really get deep understanding and, and deep um, input into where the students at and how they are understanding the questions so that's that's bloom's taxonomy do you use bloom's taxonomy much in primary school I, I'm, I'm... yes yeah we do yeah that's good. all right and finally once i once i've got all of that once i thought about the questions that i'm going to ask then i'm going to start to say all right well what learning activities will i use i i don't tend to get the learning activity and then try to get my quest my blend my lesson to work with the learning activity i normally start with those questions and then try to find an activity that works or create one that works from there um, and then i just wanted to talk a little bit more about questioning because that, that's that's what i've been trying to focus my teaching on for the last uh, couple of terms um because i think the questioning has questions of two main purposes in the lesson you're either trying to promote learning you're trying to check understanding uh, or sometimes you're checking you're asking a question just to get a student just to see if a student's paying attention to you and not looking out the window but um, i don't think that's a an appropriate heading for my powerpoint um so there's there's just a couple of questions that go that are that i get off the top of my head these are my go-to questions in a lesson uh questions that i'm just going to ask um regularly around the room um, I read somewhere that teachers ask about up to 400 questions a day. Um, I can believe that. I, I ask loads of questions all the time. Alan, Why if anyone's going to do the, the Twitter screen grab at any, any stage for this and, and, and saying how it's, they're enjoying it, hopefully, those questions are so nice to have up your sleeve. So mm. uh, just reaching each of those. And, and, and what that's do, I think what they do is build the mathematician. Um, it's not, mm. what's two times three? Six. Excellent. I asked a question. Mm. And that's pointless to it tells you nothing but those ones we, we, we said about we we, we build learn uh, writers and, and readers these really are lovely questions to build mathematicians i've got a feeling they're going to be exactly the same as well now's your screenshot now's when you when you yeah. tweet something that's really good <laughs> in primary yeah, so the resource we find quite useful for questioning is um on the nctm and enrich have the same um the nctm provide uh, progression maps with reasoning mm. 
and when you look through the questions in there and take the quest these are the question stems that you've got on the screen there so it's really quite useful to work on those with teachers like just i said i haven't, I haven't created much helen i've, I've stolen lots <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, but people get in the habit of using them then, and, yeah. and not just in maths lessons either. It, these yeah. are questions that, that work well in any lesson. It's, initially, when I started to focus on questioning in my teaching, I had these questions printed on my desk so that I could think about, so that I had them there. But it, it's about forming habits, and the more you, the more you practice them, the, it just becomes second nature. Um, I, I, I keep referring back to, I've, I've been working on questioning, I've been teaching a long time, and it, occasionally, I'll pick something up in my game, in my lessons that I, I'm not quite happy with. So um, I, I try to focus on a different aspect of my teaching every term. And questioning has been my focus for the last term, which is why it's, it's over here. Last, sorry. I was going to say, what a good idea to have those printed on your, on your table. Honestly, yeah. that's really, really nice because they're such good questions that are going to probably be in every lesson, they're going to be applicable. Mm -hmm. um, and making them understand conceptual understanding reasoning is just huge with those questions mm -hmm. really really good yeah um, i quite like the bottom one down here why is this not an example of um trying to give students uh, trying to get students to look at non-examples and why things mm -hmm. aren't that um just so you give them draw them a draw a, a diagram and say why is this not a polygon uh, oh it's it's got a, a round it's got a curved edge or something like that the curved surface um, the curved side yeah that sort of thing adam adam producer adam because i'm doing his chatting for him today but he's just put it mm -hmm. on that the frayer model's really nice for these yes uh, and it is it, it, it's a superb way of getting reasoning as well but not non example and the example's really key in variation no you're absolutely yeah. right love this slide yeah oh thank you um, all right, so then you wanted to think about, you wanted me to talk a little bit about resources that I use. Um, and there's, there's just so much out there. I've got that little diagram there because the internet's just got so much. Um, I, I, I don't think you should be taking stuff off the internet and just using it. I think what you need to do is take something, look at it, edit it, adjust it, make it right for your context because the, the resources that are produced are right for certain contexts. So I, I think one of the things is go out there and explore everything that's on the internet, but make sure that you don't just print it off willy-nilly. You've got to kind of edit it and make it right for your context and for your class. Um, so always, these are the things that I've just got always in my classroom. I've got a visualizer. I think that's a huge, that, that's, uh, again, that was something I focused on last year, I think, the use of the visualizer in my lessons, because I wanted students to be able to see their work on screen and it's just such a nice, easy way to just bring their work to this board, have a look what's good about this, what could be done to improve it, where, where have they made a mistake, or why is this an excellent piece of work. I think if you've got mixed attainment, if, you, if you're teaching mixed attainment groups, Visualizer is such a huge part because every student will get an opportunity to look at fantastic work or look at a mistake and then analyze that mistake. Um, so if you don't have a visualizer, I'd highly recommend getting one. Mm -hmm. A lot of teachers are also using iPads, aren't they? And using um, Apple TV or um, Reflector app and, and apps on the iPad to do a similar thing. Yeah, yeah. You basically just want to let your students see something that uh, you you want students to be able to look at each other's work. And barring getting everyone gathered around one table, visualizer or an iPad or something like that, really, really good for that sort of thing. Um, many whiteboards. Again, if you don't have them, please get them. They're just brilliant for just ask, asking a group of students to the same sort of question, getting it up, hold up the answer. It's it's so good in terms of getting feedback really, really quickly. I don't, and I don't then, know what, if there, if there was one, I think, I've done a load of snapshot questions at the end when we get to the final 10 minutes where we have to go bam, 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 bam. And I'm gonna mm. answer mine now. What's the one thing I would always have? Visualizer yeah. was so close, but number, no, mini whiteboards is number one for me. Um, yeah. It's yeah. every child, you can get those who, if they don't understand, they can tell you, uh, yeah. or they can tell you that they, on bothering, uh, but at least you can direct your questioning. And yeah. by the way, questions that uh, someone shared on the chat, I think it was uh, Amanda, that they've got those kind of questions on the back of the wall for, for teachers, but also oh, for the students to use oh, for those conversations yeah. to be discussing. Yeah. So why is that an example? Why does that work? Why doesn't that work? You know, and, and that's a really, really nice idea. And people are responding yeah. to that sort of make sure it was noted. Helen, Thank do you, you use many, many whiteboards in primary? Absolutely. Um, as I say, that's one of my, uh, must have resources in any less than the mini the mini whiteboard um i find some because i travel around to other schools quite a lot 
Um, and very often I will go to schools that don't have them or don't have enough for each child. Um, so I always have um, 30 in my bag. <laughs> just in case. Um, because I think they're just so quick and easy to just get a real yeah. quick assessment. Yeah. Who's got it, who hasn't. And I think in primary though, you do have to train the children. Um, oh, you still train them in secondary. And, Oh yeah, <laughs> you, you've got and to you will all write something on there, and you will all hold them up at the same time. Hard. And here it is, and when it gets handed back, it's some reason it looks like this. Yeah. Um, and do you know what? That might be worth mentioning because when I do do my training in schools, and I have people worried about the this stuff and how do we behave. You know, so how do you both handle behaviour when it comes to that? Uh, because yes, there's the drawing on them, and yes, there's where do you put these? But what routines do you use? Um, you yeah, know, they're like gold dust has just been pointed out, very difficult mm -hmm. to always get hold of, but they're so important. How do you manage them so they can be part of your lessons? Because some teachers won't use them, I know, because they're worried about the extra physical items in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I've got pots of resources in, in my room, which I have centrally placed on the desks. And I just make a note of what's in each of those pots. And then at the end of the day, I'll have a look at it. And occasionally I'll have to shame the, the groups as they come through and they go, guys, there were five pens in this pot the other day. And now I've only got two. What's happened here? And, and generally, if, you, if, you're, if you're on them really early, then if you, if you, if you mention these things early, and you maintain those standards early, then I find that students generally are pretty good at it. And also, if it's the same pot on the table, they've got to look after it because they, otherwise they've got to come to you to get those extra resources and they won't have the same things that the, that the other tables will have. So I've got pots and I've got numbered pots so I know which pot goes on which table. Helen, is there anything different you do? I I, I work in my base school, um, and I think a couple of the teachers may be on here today, but in my base school, we have nursery and reception children where mm. we train them. Initially, they'll have a set of resources each, and then by the end of reception year, they, they have been accustomed to using mm. resources and sharing them with a partner. Um, and it is just expectations. Initially, we will choose what we put out perhaps that we won't put a huge big box of resources of every different resource under the sun mm. um, we will limit and think very carefully what do we want out on the tables for this lesson today um not necessarily just one thing but we'll, we'll think carefully about what goes out but at the same time i go to other schools where the, the children aren't accustomed to using resources um, and i'll go in and i'll teach a lesson and they're children that don't know me um, i just spend five minutes at the beginning of the lesson setting out my expectations and they, they, they're fine I think it's just being careful careful planning making sure you've got the right stuff out making sure the children know what it's there for it's not there to play with it is there for a purpose um so yeah just being organized as well I think it's about got loads planned so I keep I keep we keep getting there's loads of good remarks in the chat by the way people um mm. Uh, but yes, <laughs> and then let's, I want to move on because I want to make sure we get all of your stuff in there and, and definitely Helen's as well because it's yeah. already caught it to 11, good Lord. Is it? Gosh, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up a little bit. Chalkboard wall stickers. Um, I, was, I was walking through a shop and found chalkboard wall stickers um, and decided to stick them to my classroom desks instead. Um, and because it, it, it's quite a few students don't want to write in their text, in their exercise books if they think they're going to get it wrong. So I let them write on the chalkboard on their desks. So if they make a mistake, it doesn't go into their into their book. Because I think fear of getting something wrong often limits students from writing into their book. They, they, quite a few of my students like to have a, um, very neat work that's always correct. And it means that sometimes they don't write very much. So um, that, that's just an extra resource that's just always in my room. Uh, sometimes then, so I mix, I mix it up. I, I, I don't use these all the time. Uh, it's about finding the right resource for the, um, for the activity. Um, if I haven't used something for a while, I think, well, actually, let's see if I can find something. Maths loops are brilliant. Um, if you, if you've never spotted, if you've never used them before, they're a collection of 12 to 16 to, I think it goes up to 20 questions where there's a question and then on a different card is the answer and on that on that has a different question and it, it creates a loop which is quite nice. Tarsiers are an obvious one. I think hopefully everyone's used Tarsiers before. Um, but if you haven't, they're, they're brilliant jigsaws and they don't need to just be used for math. They can be used for loads of different things. 
Um, Mr. Barton Matz has got a really nice little subsection on Venn diagrams. I love Venn diagrams. Um, there's so much thinking that you can get out of with them, um, which is just, it's just huge. Um, so if you have Mathsvens.com, I think. Mathsvens.com, yeah. Yeah. Mathsvens yeah. 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 Um, Resourceaholic is a great one for maths. It's kind of my go-to one recently. I really, really like it. I'm just going to move this. Are you still able to look at my screen and can you still yeah, see it? Yeah, uh, just while you're looking for that, while you're, if you're going to load it, maths loops. Um, some people won't, won't often use them because they don't want to go through the time of cutting them all out, etc. If you minimize them onto one A4 page, it's then actually a, a series of questions you can still read, but then you can check if the answer's there themselves. I mean, yeah. you know, why, one reason I got part of Tarsia was the amount of time laminating and took ages mm. and then it didn't come back. And if one's missing, the whole set's ruined, etc. Mm. Um, you can actually just print the screen and, and, and print the um, all of them on one page. It, it'd be really smart. But this website obviously is great. And that book on the right is also really nice. Yes, um, I didn't I didn't put this one on my PowerPoint because I was going to refer to it now. But one of the brilliant things about maths, one of the <laughs> show off. <laughs> One of the brilliant things about maths, one of the reasons why I love it, is just that there are so many different ways to get to the answer, and there's no right way. It's it, 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 every different. It, and this book by Joe Morgan, she's written it really, really well. Has a load of different methods to do things, uh, ways to multiply, ways to um, divide, ways to do polyno work with polynomials, factorize polynomials. It's brilliant. So I would I would highly recommend that book as well. You've stolen um, off Phil, by the way. He sent a chat message saying, can you give a copy back? <laughs> <laughs> really nice. I, it's in my classroom at school. I can, I can give it back, I promise, Phil. Uh, the fluent, for, for fluency, having two methods and comparing them, what's the same, what's different, and mm. there's understanding as opposed to just follow the algorithm. Please, people, don't be scared to have two methods and say, well, where, well they've got the same answer, but where have they both been? What's happening in that operation that's happening the same here, like you do with non multiplication if you were to do it in a grid method as much as i know that's not allowed in the exam in the sats yeah. there is lovely conceptual understanding comparing them and that's what's so good about that book yeah um sorry i've just had a look at the time i'm going to so give you go... five minutes alan because i want to make okay. sure we have a good chunk of yes. i will i will go i'll go a little bit quicker now um and I'll sorry Helen, i don't want to take up your time um the one thing i just wanted to note though is that the, i don't think the resource is as important as how you use it and how it promotes learning um I've got this picture on my screen of a Swiss roll because it comes from an anecdote of Craig, uh, from Craig Barton's book, How I Wish I'd Taught Maths, um, which again, if you haven't read it, it's, it's a really good read. Um, and in it, he talks about a lesson that he did with year seven, um, where he wanted to look at the minimum number of cuts needed to equally share seven Swiss rolls between 12 people or 12 Swiss rolls between seven people. I can't remember, but it was basically, he wanted to cut Swiss rolls up. And the takeaway, it, he, he writes very nicely about this, but the takeaway was the students thought more about the Swiss rolls than they did about the maths. And that, that can be a real, um, that, that's something that you've got to think about when you come up with a, with a lesson, with, with a resource. You've got to think, actually, is this going to promote learning? I've done lots of fun lessons in the past where I just thought, actually, they've, they've been more interested in cutting these things up than they are doing the maths. So I think at the moment there's a lot of um, lessons for home learning on yep. different sort of platforms that have been produced and I know some of them have been produced quite hurriedly um, but some of those are more about entertainment than mm. actual maths mm. and and those are you know something to be wary of isn't it yes yeah absolutely I mean well, although at this stage with my home learning with my daughter I'd take anything just I'll, I'll take entertainment <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so we, we talked a little bit about mixed attainment already, um, so I'm, I'm going to go reasonably quickly through this. I think every class and every school has mixed attainment, but what we talk about with mixed attainment really is we, we no setting. Um, and people have this idea of ver uh, mixed attainment versus mixed ability. Um, because when you, when you talk about setting, you're generally setting based on test results. And test results do have some part of it um, of with ability, but a lot of it is also things like were the students able to, do they have good revision techniques, do they have an environment at home which allows them to revise. Um, so it's not all just about ability, which is, um, so mixed attainment is, is probably a better way to think about that. Um, 
And there's in this book about that, isn't there? Um, just a reminder yeah. of that. Uh, it really yeah. it breaks it down very nicely. There's, there's a lot, it, it just emphasizes for me that there's a lot more going on with test results than just how good they are at maths. Like if they've, if they've had a couple of bad days or, or if they've missed school for some reason, um, it, it really does, it really does heighten it for me. Um, so when I, so I, I don't currently teach in a mixed attainment school. Um, well, it is, it is, we don't set in my school, but it's, it's slightly different because we are a grammar school. But when I taught at the University of Birmingham School, it really did heighten my awareness of the need to differentiate and the different ways to differentiate. It's, I, I don't think there's much use in giving three different worksheets every lesson for groups because it's, it's not sustainable for one. It, it means the teacher's workload is huge. And um, again, you, you may as well be, uh, you limit students by giving them a particular worksheet. So I quite like using low threshold, high ceiling tasks and goal free problems. I'm just going to exit the PowerPoint again because there's some really nice things. I think you've mentioned Enrich already, Helen. Um, yeah. Where's Enrich? Enrich has got some great stuff on um, on low threshold, high ceiling. Um, and if you if for people watching, if you don't use Enrich, Enrich is is super uh, resource for anyone doing that. Um, and it's not, it, it, it says here, it used to just, it was created and used mainly by high achieving students, but actually there's so much out there for every single mm -hmm. student. And one of the things I think that one of the advantages of mixed attainment student, uh, school um, teaching is that every student has access to the same material. Every student has the opportunity to, to learn the same stuff. I mean, they won't, but they have the opportunity to look at it, to access it and to try it. Uh, low threshold, high ceiling is fantastic for that. Um, I think what's quite nice about Enrich, I know they do a lot at the moment that's suitable for home learning. I think also looking to September or whenever children fully return to schools, a lot of their um, problems give you a really great opportunity to assess children's prior knowledge and, and identify gaps. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think that could be really useful for people. Yeah, absolutely. Goal free problems is another one. Um, which I use quite a lot. Um, it's basically you, you give students, I'll, I'll scroll up to, there we go. You give students something like that, um, a, a, a diagram or some information and you ask them to, to say what they can work with that. And it's just, it's brilliant. I, um, there's a, there's a numbers one here as well, which I quite like. So a, a competition, a prize is one every 2014 seconds. Work out what information you can from, uh, work out what you can from this information. There's really good research behind that Sweller 2014, if I was trying to be with my academic head on, um, because it takes away that panic. Mm. Uh, and this is something I use with a lot of classrooms and, and I'm really big on the, the goal free problems. Um, pupils will say, What's, look at the question and they just want to get to the answer. Yeah. And the answer is just the beginning. If it's a five mark question, you're not going to get straight to the answer. Uh, mm. And I use the expression a lot in the classroom, get the first mark. Uh, because in secondary, uh, we start, you know, certainly when it gets to year 9, 10, 11, they start really focusing on the exam, getting nervous about it. But look, don't tell me what the end answer is. I don't care. What's the start? What's the first mm. part? Get into the question. So your goal free problem you just showed there, show me what information you can derive from it. That's really important because one mark leads mm. to the next, but one point leads to the next. And, and, and goal free problems just take away that anxiety yeah. that say, oh, I don't know the answer, I'm not going to get it right. Well, actually, just tell us what you can do, and then it will progress. Um, yeah. Really, really nice accent, really nice idea for all classrooms. And, and this isn't just mixed attainment, the things you're saying here. You've got to point that out, because I don't want anyone who oh, yeah. is vehemently no. against it. These are all brilliant. The low threshold, high ceiling are great resources in every classroom. Yeah. Well, like I said, right up at the top there, every class is mixed attainment to some degree. So you can use, you can use all of those things. Um, and it, it does, I, again, it, it forces you to think more about depth because one of the things with, with the idea of ability in maths or, um, or someone's good at maths is what we mean by that is they understand it quicker than other people. Um, and I, I think the higher, the, the students who are perceived to have an ability in maths are the ones that pick up the questions quickly and can apply their knowledge quickly. And with a little bit more time, the other students will be able to get there as well. So what do you do with the students who've understood it quickly if you need to do a whole extra lesson for the students who haven't? And you really then do have to think about the depth of what you're teaching rather than saying, all right, well, the next topic that we're teaching is this. So you go ahead and do this while I take, teach this to someone else. It just doesn't work. So I thought mixed, mixed attainment does need to 
it, it focuses that when teaching. And the national curriculum does state it, or doesn't say the word depth before breadth, but you don't move on to the next, you know, everyone can access it and you think about the depth. I'm yeah. going to ask you to stop there, Alan, if you don't mind. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to go, really there was one me. final thing that I just wanted to say, just be, like for everyone out there, when you, when you teach, and I've taught rubbish lessons and I will continue to teach rubbish lessons for many, many years. Don't tell off said that. Um, but when you do teach, be kind to yourself. Um, because not every lesson is going to be amazing and that's going to be absolutely fine. So, yeah. All right. I'm going to stop sharing and let Helen do because I've talked for way too long. Apologies. No, I think time goes. I mean, half past when we promised we'd end, but if we're happy, we should, if we're happy carrying on, I don't know what time limit people have got. Yeah. So, Helen, can you share your screen? Yeah, I certainly can. Let me just... Headline act. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, let me just see if I can get my technology right. Show my screen, show my screen, show my screen. If you can do a background like that, you can share your screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it, it's making sure I share the right screen. <laughs> uh, we can see a lot of slides at the moment, so it looks like... Yeah, I'm just... Can you see it now? Everyone can learn mathematics. Fantastic. And we can see your notes on the right-hand side for the next slide as well. Oh, can you? Oh, uh, it does, no, is that all right? Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, no, really, a lot of the way I teach maths and I plan maths lessons has come from my training on the Teaching for Mastery programme. Um, so again, linking back to the five big ideas, just like you did at the beginning of the session. Every time I think about a lesson, I'm thinking about each one of those and how that fits and how that will support the learning. Now, some schools when they come and start working with me in, in my consultancy role and, and different roles I have um, get too hooked up on this and thinking it's kind of a tick list to tick off um, and then I just look back and I think well actually when you look at some of those things and you look at research coming from elsewhere such as you know EEF it actually is just about good maths teaching yep. it's just about good maths teaching whether you're in early years whether you're in anywhere through primary in secondary things like the cpa approach nothing in that is new that's just come about the nctm didn't invent those those ideas um, when i'm planning a maths lesson these are the things i'm i'm thinking about i think about the national curriculum um, and the long-term plan um, obviously thinking about where those particular children are right now what is their prior knowledge and i know that's going to be tricky with children coming back um thinking about the next step and small steps not jumping ahead too quickly and leaving children behind small steps um but then also thinking about actually how do we go deeper and how do we enrich that that learning thinking about the maths vocabulary and thinking about the general vocabulary especially with younger children and a lot of my experience has been working with children where English isn't their first language. So sometimes maths vocabulary needs to be learned, but also other vocabulary to access the maths. Always thinking about the key representation in a maths lesson. Always planning what if. What if a child really struggles? Not, I am going to give this different thing to my red group who will all be sat together. But what if a child struggles in this lesson? What am I going to do? How am I going to do it in a different way? Have I got something up my sleeve? What if someone just gets this quite quickly? Um, how am I going to challenge them? What is the learning going to look like in their books? What am I expecting? Um, what's the practice going to look like? Are they going to be practicing in this lesson? And, and really planning those key, key questions. I feel a little bit like we could do a session uh, of snap with books because all the books that, you, that you've been holding up I can hold them up and we can see if we can hold up the same book. Go on. Um, Sing it, Helen. Hopefully this breaks. Um, yeah, I've got that one. I'm hoping this breaks down a few barriers though, because we got that say, one that's, that secondary, that's secondary maths, that's primary maths. That was kind of one of the things I wanted to achieve from today, which I assumed we wouldn't. It's already happening. Maths yeah. is maths. It um, absolutely and, and is. We're teaching the same thing. We've got to be aware of where we are on the journey. And I remember making this point in a previous session, and I think it's from the court's book, where you've got to teach ready for them going forward as well. It's not to the, I'm a year nine teacher and a year 10 topic. I'm not bothered about going forward for that. I need them to perform today. And I haven't, I've taught them a trick that doesn't help them go forward. All of that, no matter what age you teach, you have that responsibility to teach supporting going forward as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's math teaching and and, and um yeah i'm really chuffed that we're saying so many similar things <laughs>
Yeah, I, was, I think too many people get hooked up on this word mastery and teaching for mastery and, uh, again. And if you just think about good math teaching, just think about that. Yeah. Um, again, one of the key things, one of the things out of those five big ideas I'd look at first is very much the representation, representing the structure of the maths, not getting children to produce lots of correct answers to questions. Um, I know I've done so, sessions on representation, Helen, but I really want to make sure that's repeated again for, for secondary colleagues because mm -hmm. I had a meeting recently with primary and secondaries and the primary turned around and said, hold on, you, you don't use manipulatives in secondary and not many do. And why is maths different mm -hmm. in secondary? Why are we suddenly scaring them and teaching them in a different way? They've got used to a method, they're learning. I mean, the primary teachers are so engaged right now. And in year seven, now it's time for a textbook. Uh, yeah. And we're not going to play with manipulatives anymore. What a shame. Yeah. What a shame that we changed. It is. I, I know some some people say to me, oh, well, we don't have the money, we don't have the funds, we don't have the resources. But actually, you don't need a lot of resources and you don't need a lot of money. Um, you do need to think about what you're using and why you're using it. It's not a toy. Also, some teachers say, Oh yeah, but if they get hooked on the res on the resource, they can't use that in the test and things like that. Well, they're not using the resources correctly then, because actually every lesson, the children might be using resources at the beginning, but by the end of the lesson, they'll have moved away. The resource mm -hmm. isn't there as a crutch for them to hold on to. The resource is there to understand the concept and then move away from it, rather than oh, I need those counters because I can't do the maths. And they're there to understand the maths. Um, so yeah, thinking very, very simple resources, you know, very, very, these are kind of my go-tos that I would always have in my classroom, but everything that's made of plastic, I, I can offer an alternative that would be in your house right now, or you could make really, really quickly. Um, I've been doing a lot with home learning over the last few weeks. There's nothing that's in a school classroom that actually you couldn't really quickly use at home and make at home. So, so money doesn't have to be an option and home learning doesn't have to be an option. Uh, I, I saw Sorry. Van Hart, I think it was a, a just a couple of weeks ago, he, he said a sentence which really clicked with me and I think, you're a bit, I think I've heard this from you as well. CPA approach isn't linear. If you're at the abstract and you struggle, yeah. you go back to drawing a picture, you go mm. back to playing with some manipulatives. Absolutely. And when you said Absolutely. the waffle earlier on, I was thinking about that, thinking backwards. What if I am struggling? Oh, I'll go and play with that and oh yeah, I, I can recreate that journey. Oh good, I can recreate that picture and now I'm back to the abstract. It's not this linear approach. It's to be flexible between them. You're right, though. Of course, the point is to get to the abstract. It's not to replace it, but it's to support yeah. the journey to be able to achieve the abstract. That's a really important learning point. I also think it's handy. You might plan to have a particular resource in a lesson, but you might encounter a child that's actually got some gap in their prior knowledge. So, or they're not understanding it the way you presented it. So having something else, or they're not getting it with this, so actually, can I show it in a different way? Can I use a different resource? Um, and also with young children, if they're not getting it with the, the counters, the cubes, whatever, go back to the biggest concrete resource, then get them up and act it out, you know, with each other, with a real life sort of story. Go back to that till they've got it and then move forwards. So yeah, there's absolutely. Some, there's some really good work um, done on something called people maths, um, which yeah. is, which them doing all sorts of different things like that and it's it's great to do those sorts of, yeah, yeah. Really and not being afraid to, to go back to that i think the other thing is you've mentioned before when you were talking about visualizers if children are doing something at their tables unless you can all see it and talk about it it doesn't work so there's various ways of doing that but um whether it's a visualizer whether it's you know some kind of app or whether it's just using your interactive whiteboard and actually having things on the whiteboard that you can manipulate and the children can manipulate. Um, mm. So I think that's important. One of the things I've noticed is that primary teachers don't get a lot of training in how to use their whiteboards. They've all got whiteboards in their classrooms and there's some wonderful resources inside the whiteboard. Um, but sometimes teachers don't realise they're there and they spend a lot of time making and creating things that they don't have to. Um, so I think that's quite important. Um, the other thing that you know I think is really important is, as we've said, is about working with colleagues. So I'll I'll flick through some ideas from a, from a lesson um, that I've taught in year three, and I've seen other teachers teach. So basically, looking at the beginning of a lesson, 
children starting a lesson at the tables with a talk partner with some resources when we plan a lesson planning that from the outset every child will be able to access that lesson there won't be a barrier so if i know the specific children in my class that, that there might be barriers i plan to overcome those at the beginning um, and really that first so this is you know a problem that might start a lesson it's an anchor task so instead of telling the children, right, today you are going to learn, this is the learning objective, this is the success criteria, we might start a lesson, and again, it's not a formula and a tick list, every single lesson has to start like this, but a lesson very often will start with a problem, here you go, there's some resources out, work with the partner, what are you going to do? And as a teacher, I would be going around that classroom, watching, listening really carefully, what are the children doing, what are they talking about? Um, and while I'm doing that, I'm thinking really carefully, what am I going to pull out? Who's got this? Who's got this already? Who doesn't understand this? Who's got some gaps? Um, which examples am I going to pull out of that? Which ones am I going to share with the class? Which order will I share those in? Um, so at the planning stage, I'd be very much thinking, what might the children do with this? Where is this going? How is this going to take the lesson where I want it to go? This particular lesson is about scaling and it's for year three children. And I found that children um, in key stage two really trouble, um, struggle with, with scaling. Um, so, and a lot of that can be around the vocabulary. So thinking really carefully, how can we introduce that? And when you think about twice as many and all the different vocabulary that comes around that, you can see why they might struggle. So lessons that are very episodic. A few years ago, um, a primary lesson might have started with an introduction. Uh, the children would have had, the teacher would have shown them how to do something. The children would have had a go at doing it. And then there would have been a plenary at the end. But lessons are very different, very episodic. So there's a lot of throwing things out, letting them have a go, observing, bringing it back, modeling, children modeling, teacher modeling, asking questions. Um, looking at not just one way of doing it we mentioned that earlier didn't we mm -hmm. so children coming to the board or children sharing well that's one way of doing it and that's another way what's the same and what's different what's going on there so it's Tom. no i just i mean that, that's banhar isn't it it's going to be a clever day today uh, can yeah. we do it more than one way as he always puts it and it, it is so and again it's, yeah. it's when i've seen practitioners only show one method and say that's the one and we had this conversation in my department last week, actually, and we were challenging that, saying, well, we're, we're discussing what's our agreed method as a department, uh, which is important to think about where we are on the journey. And even having that conversation is great professional development. But it was questioned straight away, saying, well, if we only show them one. And the point, therefore, afterwards is absolutely right. Imagine they struggle with that one. Get the second method, compare them. Um, and, and a third method, that's fine. But again, as long as you're comparing them as opposed to just using them as three separate algorithms, which doesn't yeah. have a, uh, a use, mm. but those separate algorithms, well, where are they the same? Um, but just such a similar thing you put on screen there, uh, you just said find two ways. It's all you type there, and you're immediately extending their thinking. You're immediately making them work out a little bit harder and, and uh, find, find me another way, find me another way. It's really, it's, it's another up your sleeve question. And it's quite good that some children will get the answer quite quickly. They've got one way, they'll get an answer, and they think done, they want to move on. And it's quite good to slow them down, to get them to look, well, well, someone else has done it this way, what's going on here? Can you show it that way? And sometimes that really throws them because they're looking at something in a different way. Or if someone's made a mistake, well, can you see where it's gone wrong? Can you explain where that has gone wrong and, and help us out there? And some of those are ways that just make children think a little bit harder. Um, again, different ways of modelling it on a board so that we can actually manipulate what's on the board. We tend to get some things on the interactive whiteboard. I don't use PowerPoint, I use the interactive whiteboard a lot. So I've converted it into PowerPoint for this session. Um, but having things that actually move, that, that represent what the children have on their tables, um, is really important. You can Hello. see... Sorry, just to, I mean, I want to make sure that for, for those who, I know, I know I saw one message earlier on saying that the, the secondary teachers don't get a lot of training necessarily on interactive whiteboards. Neither to uh, primary. As a PGCE teacher, I have to say, I didn't do it as a major part of it because many schools 
you buy a whiteboard, then it doesn't get fixed. And it's and as soon as it doesn't work anymore, you start, and then I think that's been a, a bit of a barrier, but you both suggested the visualizer and that's mm. where it yeah. comes alive. And it's at least the backup. Don't be, oh, well, I can't do what Helen's saying here because my, 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 my screen doesn't work. You've got another option, you get the visualizer. Um, mm. But you're absolutely right. Seeing it move is so much more dynamic, so much more engaging for the pupils. Mm. I've taught this lesson in a school that didn't have a whiteboard at all, actually. Um, and I used, and, and I, I took a lot of magnetic stuff because I used magnetic things on a, on a, you know, manual whiteboard. And then that wasn't magnetic when I got there. So I also had blue tack. Yes. And a lot of, uh, and a lot of coloured cards. I have that too. Yeah. <laughs> I've done this, you can do low tech, but you just need to plan and be prepared in, in advance, really, uh, mm. for whatever, whatever. Um, one of the things we work really hard on with the primary children is getting them to talk about the maths, talk in full sentences, mm. use the maths vocabulary. So there's a lot of repetition and chorusing, but we have to plan really carefully in advance. What do we want them to say? What language do we want them to use right now for these children? Are we going to introduce, you know, are we going to let them use just really informal language and then introduce the maths words later on? Or are we actually going to introduce the technical maths vocabulary now because then we don't have to teach them things twice um, so I think that's been a big shift again we might start with a real context problem but then we'd move away from that um, to something that's a little bit more um, generalized obviously this lesson is moving towards um, bar modeling and, and getting rid of the, the counters or the coins altogether mm. um, Again, thinking about prior knowledge, so, you know, if you're looking at twice as many and doubling, you know, do children understand multiplication? Do they understand, you know, repeated addition? Um, so looking at all of those things, um, again, continuously throwing out a problem. Um, sometimes, you know, is it? Is it really? Is it true? Is it false? Always, sometimes, never. Those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So throwing it out, seeing what they do with it bringing it back together and unpicking it um, and generally that's how, how the lessons kind of work as the lesson works its way through I know I'm just flying through this a little bit but you probably see that it's ramping up a little bit um, it's getting a little bit more generalized there's still an opportunity to model and based on what you see as you're going around a classroom you might not use all of this you might not do all of this um, so you're making those decisions what to pull out what to pay attention to, how far you can go with the children. Um, so it's a lot of observation, a lot of questions where they can all respond to the questions and they can talk and discuss, well, do you agree with your partner? What does your partner think? Um, can you explain that in your own words? Um, so it's not just about answers. Um, give me a quick right answer. As you said earlier, Tom, the answer is just the beginning. So if children have got an answer, it's kind of, yeah, well, so what, you know, now what? But isn't that the problem with how we teach, how well, the impression find that so Alan said at the very start, and, and I keep repeating this, Mike Askew thinks it's my favourite thing I've seen this week by a mile. You know, we, we, we want writers and readers, but we don't want mathematicians. But mm. they think, oh, it's just answering a series of questions. That's what maths is. But maths is exploring, it's conjecturing, it, it's mm -hmm. pattern yeah. sniffing. Um, it, 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 it's so much more than being able to add up. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I think getting that message through to um, parents as well is really, really important. Um, so again, you know, this lesson, moving away from the context, moving towards bar modelling, giving the children some questions, a little bit more challenge. Helen, there's a question coming in just on screen then. Uh, and I think if someone's got this speaker on, by the way, that it's coming through, I don't, I, it would be you or Helen, uh, you, you two. Um, someone's just asked, do you explain what an equation is? I noticed if you go back to a three screen, screens, Helen, uh, I saw the word yeah. equation. And also, yeah. like, you had equals sign 11 plus 11 equals 11 times 2. It was yeah. actually true, where we mm. get these people who write, let's say 2 plus 7 is 9, plus 3 equals, and these equals mm. continue in a big line. How do you use the word? You're, I'm assuming that you therefore do use the word equation. How do you use it? Yep, children. Um, the children encounter equality um, initially through a balance scale. Um, so we use things like Numicon and, and where the balance is. So they understand that. Um, and we use function machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I use a lot of 
hand signals and, and body language when I'm teaching maths. So it's really hard, difficult not to use it. Um, when I do that, the children know exactly what I mean. Um, we teach equality and inequality um, following the NCTM guidelines and, and the lessons we learned from Shanghai. Um, so we don't just teach them symbols. We teach them, you know, with cubes, with counters, with resources. Um, and yes, we introduced the word equation actually in year one. Um, the children in year one and year two um, are introduced to the word equation um, and they will be using that and understand what, what it means. So we do introduce words quite early. Um, and as I say, my base school, all the children have English as an additional language. So, and they do pick it up really, really well and really, really quickly. Because when we teach a, vote, we teach a word, we, we bring them in slowly, drip, drip, drip. Mm -hmm. alongside practice, alongside representation, alongside using it. Um, we don't just throw a load of words at them all at once and expect them to learn them. Um, so it's carefully thought out. Um, yeah, as I say, that, just a bit of an idea that is about how a lesson might evolve, how it might ramp up um, and take the children towards what they might record in their own books. So there's two ways recording could look in a primary. It could be when they journal their own thinking, their own understanding about a concept, and it's, it's far more open-ended. Or it could be, um, a lot of schools now use textbooks. Um, the base school where I work do use a textbook scheme. So it could be that they're provided with some practice, um, intelligent practice from a textbook. Um, however, just because schools use textbooks it doesn't mean that we don't also use enrich and we also use the resources on the nctm i think one of the dangers with textbooks sometimes is that teachers can just follow them religiously and not make their own decisions and you have to make your own decision for your own children how long to spend on something is that the best way of doing something is there another way um so i've just popped in an example there from from when that lesson was taught that's what a journal might have looked like. So a child in year three had actually explored that concept of the lesson and that's how they were showing their understanding of it. Anna, can you talk more about journals? Because it's not something that I, I know of it because of the, um, the math no problem mostly. Um, but of course, secondary specialists would know less about that. Can you explore it? Because look at the detail there from one pupil. Uh, and you'd be really chuffed to see that reasoning in, in a secondary school, but we, we don't encourage a lot of that, where journals very much do. Can you explore a bit more on that for us? And please don't worry for time. We've got 200 people seem to be sticking around, so they're not scared that we're going over. And I don't want you to rush, Helen, because I'm loving it, hearing what you're saying. So as long as Helen and Alan, you don't have to rush off straight away. No, I'm, um, I'm good. Alan, the kids can still be looked after. The wife's, <laughs> the wife's home, that's fine, I know that. <laughs> I've got my cat really Don't rush, but yeah, can you talk, talk through the journals? Journals, we, we introduce journals through, um, right from early years where children are exploring maths and recording it alongside. They might be recording it with chalk on the floor or with felt pens on sugar paper. But the idea that you can have maths ideas, you can explore it with concrete resources, and then you can draw pictures of it. You don't have to go straight to drawing equations, drawing numbers. You can draw pictures, your own representations. You can write about it. You can write a story about it. You can be creative. Um, and that evolves through the school. We've, we've built this up a few, a few, over a few years. And there's different types of journaling where there's descriptive journaling, there's um, investigative journaling. There's all different types of journaling to take the thinking really deep. What I have found is that children absolutely love it. Um, it really gives them ownership of the learning. It gets away from the maths can look a little bit messy sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't have to draw, draw a, you know, round something to get an accurate circle or round something to get an accurate rectangle. But it's my learning. I decide what I put in this book. This is my journal. I put a title in. It's great from a teacher point of view because actually you're not just seeing have they got the right or wrong answer. You're seeing if they've gone wrong, you can see really where they have gone wrong. And you can see some children that have got it and just about got it and other ones that have got it with bells and whistles and you can take them a little bit further. Um, so journaling, we do try and do two or three times a week. And then we also do the practice. So whether yeah. they're actually doing the maths and answering questions. Something just popped up on the chat saying they really like the use of the sentences and stuff and then should be used in secondary a bit more. And I, I absolutely agree with that. I think 
when we explain things to be able to write it down using full sentences is is a is a is an important part as well and you you've made a lot of mention about the use of language and saying things in different ways and absolutely being able to say it and being able to write it down so that other people can understand it that's really key one of the things that i'm showing there is we've had to teach children how to say a sentence when they want to talk about the maths we won't accept one or two words we will ask them we'll model it to them and we'll say right can you put that in a sentence for me can you explain it so actually they know they've got to explain it really really well and really carefully helen a couple of questions coming in about the journals because i thought second year colleagues would find these interesting um do you do journaling and practice in the same book and do you mark journals um, journals tend to be in a book that's got plain paper so the children have got the freedom. Um, personally and from experience of working with schools over the last few years, some schools try and do the practice and the journaling in the same book and it tends to merge and it's a little bit tricky to pull it apart and see it as two different things. A lot of schools where they use two different books they find that even squared paper, or they might be using a textbook and using a workbook, they find that having two separate books tends to work a little bit better. Plus as teachers, when you come together and you go, right, let's have a look at their journals, or let's have a look at their practice books. It's much easier when you're bringing them together and looking at them and moderating them and things like that. That's come up on the chat as well. Um, by the way, in case people do have to leave at half past, this is going to YouTube afterwards. So please don't worry if you, if you miss out the rest because I'm really, really enjoying this and I don't want to stop. Uh, <laughs> department, departmental meeting at 12, that can wait. That's <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not interested anyway. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be recorded saying that. Uh, carry on, Helen. I'll edit that bit on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Adam. Well. <laughs> I say lessons have always, there's always extra challenges that teachers have got up their sleeves that if children have got it and they've got it quite quickly, there's always something extra that they've, they've planned. It might be something that they've prepared, like you can see there, but actually it might just be one of those key questions that they can, a challenge that they can pull out of their head really quickly. Um, as I say, if you're using workbooks, you know, you, you might be using something like that. Some of the things that we think about, you know, if you want to challenge children, we look at the national curriculum. When the SATS questions are being designed, you can see there, you know, just recalling facts and procedures is very, very low threshold when it comes to the cognitive domains. So if we're challenging children, we don't just give them another 20 questions. Um, and again, a lot of support has come from textbooks over the last few years. However, not every school's doing that. They are expensive. Um, it is quite a big commitment. What I would say to schools, the most important thing is knowing what's out there to help and actually providing CPD. Mm. Uh, the textbooks do help you when it comes to things like variation. Um, you know, they help you to unpick that. But there's a lot of free support out there from the NCTM. They're professional development materials. Um, there's a whole section on mastery. The progression maps is reasoning where you can get the questioning from. Their mastery assessment books, how to really get, get the reasoning going. What we did, we, we take questions from these resources and we turn them into little concept cartoons like this to use in the classroom to get children thinking. Um, those and those mastery resources, to, to reiterate that, are there for primary and secondary. In fact, I can see them on your next yeah. screen. I think the screenshot, mm. I think it's just coming up. Um, there's some the assessment materials, yeah. just lovely. Lo they say assessment and they put me off immediately because, like, I don't want <laughs> test materials. And it was actually assessing the classroom. I, I misread the word assessment. Yeah. Misinterpreted. Really, really useful. Yeah, they're really good materials for, for deep thinking. And I, and I tell you, for the number of parents who, when they get in touch with me and they want to help their children at school, I always send them those. So yeah. They're the questions yeah. that make, it, make the children think and explain and reason. Someone put on the chat that we don't make our children explain in secondary enough. And I, th I think part of some of the thread of these, these sessions I've been doing is you, we're now preparing for year seven next year. Make your year seven continue from year six and five and four and three. Why aren't we journaling? Why aren't we able to explain in full sentences? Why do, why do people think it's suddenly different yeah, when they're doing representations in year 10? Now that's baby work. That's because you dropped it and forgot it to be part of maths in year seven. Um, mm. I, and I'm, I'm highly critical of, of secondary schools for this, admittedly. Um, but yes, carry on. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. <laughs> I I say, <laughs> the resources there on the NCTM are great because there's things there for, for early years. And, and in the past, early years, 
you know, there wasn't a great deal out there for them. So early years, primary, secondary, there's so many resources there that actually show you which representations you could use, which language you could use, which vocabulary you could use. So even though um, the schools I work with use textbooks, they still refer to the NCTM as well. Um, the NCTM is really useful for CPD within your setting because the amount of detail that's in there. They've also got a lot there at the moment for home learning. They've produced videos, video lessons that people can use for, for home learning um, and learning in school over the next few weeks where learning is going to be a little bit strange and children might be taught by someone who isn't their teacher. Um, and the way, just looking at these lessons and the way they're broken down, that the concepts are introduced really, really carefully. I think even just looking at some of those videos for home learning is really, really useful for teachers for CPD. On the screen there. There's a, um, a questions coming up about yeah. sharing the stuff on NCTM a little bit more. And so I'm going to put you on the spot here, Helen, and say, mm -hmm. can we do something after half term about the NCTM website? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I have done a really great, I know people to struggle to navigate around the yeah. NCTM. Those that follow me on Twitter, they'll probably know Flopsy, my maths cat. Um, Flopsy has helped me write a navigation guide for the NCTM. It's not an official one, but if Flopsy can follow it, anyone can. So yeah, by all means, <laughs> I can help you find your way around that. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, thank you so much, both of you. I've got some quick fire yeah. questions, which I thought yeah. might be fun because just to cover things. I mean, I know we could have gone into so I'm much more detail. Sharing. So let me just share, go back to my uh, um, my screen. And hopefully that will work in just a moment. Uh, so go through. I'm this. Oh, I need to get through these because I had a lot of stuff ready in case one of you just disappeared and you <laughs> were your signal went, so I had to fill gaps. Uh, so quick fire questions. Here we go, plenaries, do we always plan for them? Ladies first. We have them all the way through the lesson. We'll have little mini plenaries all the way through to, to, keep, to keep all the children together in mixed attainment. You can't wait to the end of the lesson. So little mini plenaries all the way through. Alan? Yeah, if you, if you wait until the end of the lesson to check if learning's happened, then you've wasted a good amount of time. So mini plenaries. Oh, Alan, do you know what? I remember tell, someone telling me they did the AFL at the end of the lesson, and, and I, I was shocked. And I was like, what? Yeah. But what? So the person who didn't know 40 minutes ago, um, yeah. really, really valid points. Uh, yeah. I have to say, personally, I don't plan for plenaries because you don't know where the lesson's going to go. You want it to go somewhere, but as Alan said at the start, if it's gone somewhere else, then my exit ticket, which I printed out very nicely because leadership told me to do so, is useless. So on a personal note, not a big fan. Next one. What's the most important thing you must have with you in your classroom for your lessons? I think we've answered it, but Helen? Yeah, definitely the, the um, whiteboard, the mini whiteboards. Double-sided counters and things like that, though, I'd really struggle. It doesn't have to be the plastic kind. It can be the you know paper kind or anything. But some basic resources like that are really useful. Alan? Mini whiteboards for me, yeah. Closely followed by visualizer and coffee. Um, <laughs> I don't drink coffee, but the first two I agree. Um, what's the next one? McCourt says no to starters as pupils don't take them seriously enough and don't value it as part of the actual lesson. Your thoughts, Helen? We tend to do a little bit of fact fluency at another time during the day outside of the maths lesson. The actual maths lesson starts with that lesson you know a problem or something that's that that starts that whole lesson so a little bit of sort of um uh you know memory jogging quizzes things like that practice that would probably be outside of the maths lesson Alan? yeah if it's if it's a starter that doesn't really link to the lesson if it's just meant as like a settling activity and doesn't really do anything other than mm. get them in quietly it doesn't have much point no i'm i'm the problem is with, with starters, and I don't, we, we won't be able to answer that because the number of schools who do different stuff and demand that they have a red, amber, green starter or demand that mm. they have a retrieval practice starter, and it's all different in every school. Um, my concern is uh, what the court says is, is it continued, is it considered part of the lesson? So what you say, Alan, if, if it's part of the lesson, then it makes sense to flow through. And it's, it's almost an early AFL to help you to what you need to do. Yeah, I'll have I'll have like settling activities if I know that a group is coming from PE and I'm going to have five people in at the start and then 15 minutes later the rest are going to come in. Um, but yeah, um, it's got a link somehow to the learning. What were your best le worst lessons ever? Not very quick fire question. But <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember? 
Yeah, my, my best lesson, my, my favorite one that I teach every year is introduction to hypothesis testing uh, at A-level. And my worst lesson was an observed lesson I had two or three years ago with a year eight. Uh, I can't even remember what I was teaching, but I remember it was, it was the worst. I, I, I left that lesson and, and in the observed and thought, oh God, that just went awfully. <laughs> but we need those lessons to reflect. Please remember, yeah. we, as you said earlier, really good point, by the way, we're not gonna teach perfect lessons all the time, no matter how long experience we are. And Helen is the best at what she does. And Helen, I'm, I'm sure you'll say the same. You don't teach. Never teach an outstanding lesson, I don't think. I, 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 I always say that to people. I just teach a lesson and I learn from it. I'd never teach the same lesson twice either, exactly the same. You always change it, don't you? Always reflect and, and learn from it. So that's really interesting. Yeah, that's why I left my first school. The, the, the room that Alan teaches in now is the one my first school. And I taught mm -hmm. ratio for the third year and I smiled during it. And the kids turned to me and said, Why are you smiling, sir? Obviously, I'd usually smile, uh, but it something just occurred to me and I was like, I can't tell you, but it was my decision to quit because mm. I taught the same way for three years and I thought that was mm. terrible. And it occurred to me that's awful, uh, mm. which is why I felt I had to move on, move schools. Let's do another one then. Are you brave in the classroom? <laughs> Ellen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do do some crazy things sometimes. And I, I think, especially if I think back to when I was an NQT, I know the head teacher went past my classroom quite a few times staring in through the window and, and looking at me and thinking what on earth is she doing at that time I had lower set maths um, and I do do things like I still do maths lessons outside and do all sorts of crazy things um, so I'd like to think I like I like trying new things and seeing how they go yeah. You'll, you'll remember this, Tom, from when we were offsteaded uh, many, many years ago, and the head of department at the time said to us, "Don't be afraid to try something out while you're being observed." Yeah. Um, and absolutely, don't. I, I'm quite happy to to do something weird and wacky if it will mean that the students learn and enjoy the learning. No, absolutely. I, I just, you're you're brave when you enjoy it, and um, you know when I really get into it, you're more likely just to go. And that's what I said earlier on about um, being away from the direction of the lesson. Mm -hmm. Be brave to do that because you can yeah. feel that that's what you sense the pupils needed. And so that's a brave thing for a lot of teachers when they're new to the profession because they're really mm -hmm. worried they've got to follow that rigid that rigid structure. But absolutely, if you think it, you, that's what we get as a as a teacher, isn't it? You get that sense of what they need. So be brave, go with it. I'm, I'm missing oh. it at the moment because all I'm doing is kind of this home learning stuff. It's not the same. I'm, I'm really missing being in, in lessons, <laughs> kind of doing weird things. I think I've got I a couple more of these. I a warning on there with the um, go with the children and things like that. I think you have to be experienced sometimes to do that because mm. you've got to have a, that that journey in mind and know where they're going because you, if you did that every lesson you could go quite off piste and they don't learn what they're supposed to learn experience for that yeah we said at the start didn't we with there'll be some generalized statements in here yeah. maybe yeah. five minutes then bounce back yeah, yeah. very good point uh, a couple more by the way uh, people are leaving because it's gone over half past but we've still got so many people listening so thank you again to both of you uh mention hyper helga on twitter and, and myself if you've enjoyed it as a, it'd be nice to get that appreciation there's a question i think textbooks are really useful and they save a lot of teacher time and teacher workload and they are really good um for cpd if you understand them I think you can teach really good maths lessons without textbooks. I think you can teach really good uh, maths lessons with textbooks. And just the same, you can teach a really poor maths lesson with the textbook. Just because you've got a textbook doesn't mean it's going to be a great maths lesson. Um, yeah. I think you need to understand them, choose them carefully. Yeah. And remember, you are the teacher and you know your children and what's right for your children at that time. Yeah, it's not just about the resources, it's about how you use it. I'm still struggling to find a good textbook that I like for GCSE. So if anyone listening has got one, that would be a really useful one. Because um, I, I haven't found one that I'm particularly happy with. But they're, they're okay, as long as you use them properly. I, I'm just going to agree completely. Yeah, I like to have two or three and choose questions from each on a personal note. Mm. Um, I've seen one textbook that's called Key Stage 3 Maths Now, which just tries to break up fluency reasoning and problem solving, mm. uh, which is quite nice if you are thinking about that direction as an AO123 uh, activity. And even if it's not the question I like, it's just the idea of reminding me I want mm. fluency reasoning and problem solving questions. Um, oh, anything wrong with the three part lesson? Start a main plenary. 
Personally, I like to start a lesson with throwing a problem out there because it really gives me a chance to assess the children. I like to stop all the way through that episodic nature of the lesson allows me to pick up the children that haven't got it mm -hmm. and push the children who have got it even deeper. Mm -hmm. So I think having that real episodic lesson is mm -hmm. the way of meeting the needs of all the children personally. You yeah. can give the child what they need. One thing that I don't think we've mentioned at all today is we talk about lessons sometimes, but you don't know how long it's going to take for them to learn a certain key learning point. Mm -hmm. And you, you, yeah. you hope it's a 60 minute or whatever, what a time, what a time you got, but it might end up being two of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the word lesson, I often wish we didn't use that because people associate that with a period, a 60 mm -hmm. minute period or 50 minute period where lesson, I prefer to say key learning points. It might just take longer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is, I didn't like this question, but I, I forgot to remove it, but never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on. Ooh. No, no, no. I was just, go on, go on, Alan, if you're going to that. No, no, I was just wondering if that, no, again, as long as you don't use three-part lesson every time, I, I try to mix things up. So yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you don't use it on every single lesson because kids will get bored. Are they important? Because some schools say you've got to have them on at the start. Well, I think they're important that the teacher knows what the key learning is for that lesson. I think the issue is children don't necessarily learn a national curriculum learning objective every single day. So I think it's pulling out the key learning for that day, where it fits in the big picture. I don't think you need to have it written on the board at the beginning of the lesson. And I don't think children need to write it in their books or stick it in their books because for year one children, sometimes that can take up most of the lesson. Yeah. And I think if you tell children at the beginning of a lesson, today you're going to learn about division with remainders and here's your success criteria, I think it can take away from, <laughs> from the lesson and the learning and the assessment. Mm. Um, but I think teachers need to know them. Yep. Alan? Yeah, absolutely agree with that. I, I don't often share learning objectives with my students until toward, uh, until the end and I say, all right, well, what do you think we've been working towards today, kids? So, yeah. And if they can't tell you, that's a really good then, piece of yeah. assessment, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Many plenary. That's a really nice, really nice plenary. Not have, yeah, absolutely. Having to write that down, completely agree with you. Uh, final, we'll go with this as the final one then because uh, I don't want to keep it on for too long. And I do have a department meeting to go to. Sorry, mm -hmm. my department. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, what's the top piece of advice you'd give about lesson planning, Helen? I would say um, try not to do always do it on your own. Talk to colleagues, you know, discuss with colleagues, especially if you're, you're new to teaching. But, you know, no matter how long you've been teaching, you know, talk to colleagues, get ideas, bounce ideas off other people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I would say. Collaborative planning works best if you can. <sighs> Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think look at what's already out there because there's so many fantastic resources and websites and um, things already out there. Just find something that you like and then adapt it for for your context, for your class. Don't yeah, that, that's my advice. Yeah. You'd have thought if I, you know, as I prepared these questions, you'd have thought I prepared answers beforehand, but I haven't, and I suddenly realised I'm going to have to answer it now, aren't I? Um, do you know one thing that I tell the trainees is it's trying to make sure you, you can't plan the perfect lesson and don't spend so long doing it, certainly for trainees, but when you've been doing it longer, the, the time does get quite quicker because you start thinking, will the resource do? Is it good? Is it good enough? It doesn't have to be the best resource. And it's often the, that beating up, have I really, was it low threshold, high ceiling enough? Was there enough intelligent practice? Was there enough problem solving? Well, you know, I, as much as this is quite a negative piece of advice to a certain degree, do you know what? Sometimes go with what you've got ready mm. because it, it can be the biggest drain on our, on our profession. Mm. Uh, it's always advice. easier to plan a lesson um, in the middle of October than at the beginning of September as well, because at the beginning of September, you don't really know your children. Mm. By the middle of October, you know your children and you, you can plan much easier when you know the children and it comes much easier. I'm going to click Phil. That was my last one already. That, I didn't remember that. Uh, it was Thank a Teacher Day this week. Uh, so at this stage, I thank Hyper Helga on Twitter. Uh, Helen, uh, Alan as well. Um, so nice to just to sit down and chat with you for this long. Honestly, really, really enjoyed that. 
Um, I'd say thank you to everyone for joining in. If you've enjoyed this session, it will be on YouTube later. Speak Like a Mathematician is one I really enjoy, but sessions and algebra tiles. Teaching for mastery with a question mark, because Helen said it as well. It's this big obsession about the word mastery, and so I, I did a session on that. I think we might break them down a bit more after half term. But my next session will be after half term. Take a week off. Um, I, I've got an idea what I'm doing after half term, and Helen's already agreed to one thing. That's great. Uh, but thank you for everybody for taking the time to listen, and hopefully it's been enjoyable. It's been lovely that so many people are joining in. Uh, you can see our Twitter handle. There's my Twitter handle, and, and, and yeah, make sure you say hello to Helen as well and follow her because she shares photos of, of, of um, her, her cat continually. And math. <laughs> whenever she sees maths, is it, as soon as Helen sees a photo of something that's mathematical, click, share. Uh, and that's really nice because maths is all around us. We need to build mathematicians, people. Whether it be primary or secondary, maths is maths. And I think that's probably one of the key things that's come from this. Helen and Alan, thank you so much. Honestly, really, really. No thank you.